if you had opened this game of EU4 starting and playing as Solon in the Far East Siberia, you'll notice that this seems to be one of the worst games possible for 1550. I've beaten the Emperor of China, but I also have a tribal government that fixes me into a duchy rank. I have only 43 ducats of income and I have a miserable mana generation also because of the fact that I have no estates at all. But that is just what you can see. That is just the tip of the iceberg. Because below the surface you see that the duchy rank is not a problem at all. Money is only a problem because I'm investing it into the seventh largest army in the world. And that monarch power generation is actually 55 Atman, 59 Diplo and 30 military points each month. I'm the student and I present you the obscurest yet very easy path to infinite monarch power. So obviously I didn't start as Solon for, uh, you know, no reason. I started as them because they are the biggest Siberian Native Council in the game. The interesting thing about the Siberian Native Council reforms, of course it's a tribal reform, so you have to stay tribal in the end. The interesting part about that is that you can't get that otherwise. You have to start as a nation with that reform, which is Solon and the neighboring, pro uh, neighboring nation over here, which is uh, Nivk, and uh, of course all four of these uh, Kamchatkan nations over here. All of these uh, six nations start with that reform, okay? Uh, actually, it goes to mention that there is also a Polynesian tribe reform for uh, nations in starting in these islands over here that uh, literally works the same way but is worse because of the modifiers. So this is definitely the best way to do it because as you can see with Solon over here, you can very easily get into uh, Ming once they blow up or cause them to blow up. Let's talk about the special effect of the Siberian Native Council. The Siberian Native Council allows migration. You can see that over there on the top. Now, you can see that I'm still allowed to migrate. If you go to a bordering uh, uncolonized province, you can see that, that there is a button that I could click if I were a one province miner to migrate, okay? And as long as this button over here shows up, still means that you are migratory, okay? Now, of course, I can't migrate because I have more than one province right now, but I'm still counted by the game as migratory because I could migrate at any moment if I, you know, gave up all my provinces except one province, I can migrate away through Siberia to Russia if I wish to. Now what I found is that there is a very interesting CB which is called Force Migration. And that Force Migration CB, you can see I have that on this nation over here in the Far East. This CB is given to you if you are a migratory nation, which, uh, you know, I showed I am a migratory nation. And if you have discovered another migratory nation, you immediately get that CB, Force Migration, okay? It basically makes you, uh, it basically wants you to force them off of their province so that you can then migrate to that, right? That's the idea of their CB. Now, you could also get that to, um, with native tribes, but then you only get that CB if, you, if that nation is on the tribal land of your nation. And as I have no tribal land, I'm, you know, I'm migratory, but I have no tribal land, so I can't get that CB on native tribes, so I have to get that CB on other Siberian native councils which in this case I have left one of them alive for demonstration purposes, okay? Now you can see this guy is of course also a reformed advanced tribe, so he's going to stay a Siberian native council until the end of the game now. And that means that he is also technically migratory and I am migratory, so I get that CB. Now let me just declare war on them with that CB right now. 
Okay, now that I have actually enough military points, I can barrage that now and assault for only, you know, 900 defenders. That shouldn't be a problem at all. You can see this is already occupied right now. Now, if you have a look at the peace options over here, you're going to see, of course, the force migration that I can't do because he has no valid target to migrate to. Of course, I have blocked them from migrating, basically. But you can also see that there is an option which is called Show Strength. And yes, it is exactly the same option that you get from the Hubiliate Rival CB. Okay, exactly the same. You can see it gives me 20 prestige and 100 of each Monarch power, as well as 30 power projection that does not stack up. So. Uh, this is basically the main point of getting 100 Monarch power in each category. I started right now with 78 Admin, 21 Diplo and 6 Military power, okay? Now you can see I've got 100 more in each of the three categories, okay? Now you can see I have a choose with them, but if I go to the Declare War button, you can see that the Force Migration CB is still there. Okay, which means that if I wait one month now until I can send a diplomat to, uh, to them again, so until the 20th of uh, August, you can see that I can simply choose break this nation for this CB. Of course, I've taken diplomatic ideas to make that less uh, miserable and less uh, effectful on the aggressive expansion, because what happens now in terms of AE is now you can see Ming has zero, Oda, which is the Shogun, has zero, uh, Kalka over here, which is the only Tengri nation left aside from myself, of course, and that, uh, my, uh, that Siberian tribe over here. They have uh, 7 AE, okay? Let me just declare war with a truce break on them right now and see what happens. You can see that Ming got 1 AE over here, Oda got 2 AE, and Kalka got like, what, 4 AE, right? That's literally all that these nations got, okay? Of course, these Chinese nations get 1 as well. And let me tell you, this is rounded up, so it's actually less than one in reality. I can, of course, immediately walk in again, which uh, is going to give them a month tick, which uh, in the end they have two month ticks of reinforcement for the garrison. But that still means I've just got 100 points, right? So I can immediately barrage and assault this province again. And that will, of course, end up in me uh, winning that war immediately within one month, actually within uh, faster than one month, because you can see I have to wait until I can send the next diplomat in two days. So let's do that. And I can now do show strength on them again. Okay, so have a look at the Monarch power and there we go. I've gained another 100 Monarch power in each three categories. And of course I'm moving back over here, which uh, by the way, these two provinces are the closest ones of all of these uh, Siberian uh, provinces. It takes you around 20 days to get from one province to the other. Now after one month I can of course truce break them again, which is a little bit more AE, but uh, yeah, no worries, I've taken espionage ideas, I will, go, I will fill these two ideas uh, very soon to get even less AE impact from that. But uh, the other problem that you're going to face is, of course, war exhaustion and stability. Now, war exhaustion is actually not a problem once it is up to 20. It cannot be bigger than 20, right? So you're just going to have to face like these uh, rebels once uh, every 10 years, of course. After that, it resets. And I'm just going to fight these rebels with my army over here while I'm doing that. And then I just at the maximum war exhaustion and nothing can happen above that, right? So that's not a problem at all. Stability is of course kind of a problem because you have to boost it up once per truce break after you got to minus three, of course, as you can see right now. But the big difference is why this is not a problem at all is that the Siberian Native Council gives literally minus 33% stability cost. And then of course I've also taken admin ideas for minus 25 stability cost. 
and I have took a, a um, Tengri decision for minus 20%, which in the end uh, results on a, as you can see, I have uh, a little bit of overextension, but I'm at the minimum cost of 90% reduction, which means that it costs me 10 admin power to boost the stability once. 10 admin points per war with these nations. And of course, let me just walk in there real quick. I also need, of course, to barrage and assault, which costs me around 44 points. Uh, so that is also what I'm going to pay. And I'm getting from that, from that investment, basically, each time I'm getting, of course, 100 of each monarch power. So in the end, that means that each time I do this war, which takes two months, of course, right? So one month uh, basically for waiting for the diplomats to return, right? One month to declare, one month to peace out, okay? So every two months, I gain 100 in each category monarch points. Then, of course, I spend 10 admin points per, you know, these two months. So actually it's 90 per two months, 100 in Diplo, I'm not spending anything else on Diplo. And it is in the end 46 points for a military because of the barrage cost. So 46 for two months, which means that in the end this tactic brings me 45 points in admin per month, 50 points in Diplo per month, and 23 military points per month, which is why in the end this means that my mana generation is not 10 in admin, but it's more like 55, and it's not 9, but 59 in Diplo, and it's not 7, but 30 in military. And that is basically what I can do the entire time now, so let me just do that for a little bit and uh, let's see where I end up after I, you know, took all of my technologies, took uh, all of these ideas and deft up my provinces. Let's just keep in mind my own development right now is 569. I'm on 12, 11, 12 in technologies and I have no idea fill filled in espionage ideas. And uh, let me just see how long it takes me to bring that to the absolute limit with that strategy. game after a little more than 13 years as you can see on the date over there and you can also see that nothing really changed in terms of borders i mean i integrated my two province minor subject over here but nothing else so i haven't conquered anything which means that the development decrease that you're going to see in a second is literally all by developing uh, because let's have a look at the obvious things first which is the coalition map mode you can see there is literally no coalition existent because of course I have a truce with these guys and then Oda over there could join a coalition as well as uh, Kalka over here but those are only two nations so they won't form a coalition of course and you can see the biggest one after that would be Ming, Dali and uh, Vietnam over there which uh, all of these three have only 33 aggressive expansion and actually I did 75 wars, so 74 truce breaks against uh, these poor uh, Siberian natives over here, who uh, then of course every single time co strength on them, gain 90 admin, 100 diplo and 46 mil points every single time I did that. 
and in combination with the uh, mana generation of my base mana generation of course so with level one advisors and with my uh, monarch over here i did a little calculation and it turns out that i in total collect or generated 21,964 mana in these 13 years, which equals around 134 mana per month in, of course, all three categories together. So that is totally insane. And now let me just show you what I could do with all of this mana, which is, first of all, I developed the institution of uh, printing press over here. Uh, of course, then immediately enacted that as well. And then I took uh, two admin technologies, three diplo technologies and two military technologies. You could see the last one was even very, very far ahead of time. In each of these categories, I'm right now 16 years ahead of time in uh, technology, as you can see. And then on top of that, I did who not one not the not only the espionage ideas but also the economic ideas that i unlocked in uh, from the 14th technology of course i completed both of these idea groups so two idea groups in 13 years and seven technologies that's how crazy it was and not even that actually i also developed a lot of provinces you saw uh, when I started this, I had like uh, 560 development. Now I have 750, which means that I literally did 200 dev clicks in 10 or 13 years, which uh, by the way, also increased my income by more than 50%. And uh, yeah, I just randomly stopped over here because, you know, I achieved everything that I wanted. I have maximum technologies so far ahead of time. I have all ideas filled out. I have a reasonable amount of money. From now on, this game is not a bad game. This is actually a pretty, pretty strong game as Solon. And of course, whenever I need some mana points, I can always just uh, go there, truce break them again, do the whole circle again until I don't need mana anymore. So this is literally the path to infinite mana. Just before I end, I want to tell you one more thing. If you want to make this even more efficient in terms of mana generation, then you should definitely leave uh, two of these guys alive. So for example, uh, this one over here in this province, so that you have then two stacks over there, one of them walking into that, one of them walking into that and back and forth and so on. Um, because then that way it is way more efficient to work with the war exhaustion because once you hit 20 war exhaustion literally every truce break that you do wins you a lot more if you consider that you don't need to uh, you know reduce that war exhaustion ever again so uh, it is way more efficient if you do it with several nations at the same time but uh, you could already see in this game how crazy strong this strategy is and i think that has to be enough for this video for this monday and we are going to see either on wednesday at parabellum one last time or as always on the next monday